justice and equality for historically disenfranchised groups. Planners are once again standing at a critical juncture in their professional development um, to, to advance just and equitable public policies and practices. In this context, the 2016 Dale Prize asks two, two straightforward questions. How have planners contributed to racial and spatial inequality? And how can we use our collective influence and expertise to alter the course of separate and unequal treatment of racialized communities? So that's our theme, and we're excited about getting started now. So I'm going to turn it over to Alvaro, who will introduce our two Dale Prize winners. Alvaro? I would like to thank myself for being here. This is like the Oscars, but with, uh, with more color. <laughs> uh, a round of applause for our awardees. We are fortunate to have two special uh, individuals going to speak with us. Uh, they've been actually with us for the past two days, and they're going to also be here tomorrow uh, and participating in classrooms. They're going to be at um, noon uh, tomorrow with the planning group. So we hope everybody at one point or another uh, has the opportunity to not just ask a brilliant question that I know you're going to ask. Uh, if not, I'm just going to pretend that you asked it and I'm going to ask it myself uh, for these two individuals, but also that you have an opportunity to uh, get to talk to them one-on-one uh, -on -one and also learn from them uh, to see if you're interested in issues of social justice, if you're interested in issues of giving people a second chance, of giving people a third chance, uh, because when, we, when we're looking at individuals that you know, grow up in, in America's uh, barrios and ghettos, a lot of times th these individuals are, are not given an opportunity uh, to make something of themselves. And uh, when they don't uh, pursue the university uh, like all of you do, then they are blamed uh, for not doing so, uh, because they're too lazy, because they don't want to speak English, uh, they don't value education, or you know, they're more interested in drugs and alcohol and, and so on and so forth. These myths, these lies that are perpetuated uh, against our people, instead of looking at the, the institutions, instead of looking at the structures of racism in this country, instead of looking at the historical problems that have contributed to an environment where gangs are created uh, to begin with. Uh, where homeless people are produced you know, because of, of capitalism and so on and so forth. Uh, so for us, in um, the excellent Department of Urban and Regional Planning, um, I, I just heard the provost is going to give us a, a new tenure track, so thank you for that. Uh, I think three now that she had those three brilliant points. <laughs> and um, so we're happy about that. To bring to bear the fact that urban planning, urban planners have a lot to do not just with the problems that were created that caused uh, despair in America's inner cities, but also that planners have the vision and the tools to solve these problems. And that's where all of you come in. This is what I believe. I believe that Cal Poly Pomona is one of the best universities in the country. I've, been, I've taught at Berkeley and I've taught at UCLA, and all of you that I've taught, that I've had the privilege to meet one-on-one, -on -one, are equally as gifted, as smart, and even more so. And part of our strength, <laughs> I need the race. And, and part of our strength, and this goes with the prize, part of our strength is our diversity. When you see all this news of campuses, of, of these, uh, a lot of these unrest, a lot of the racism that's taking place, you don't see this at Cal Poly because of our diversity, because we have people that come together and interact and don't see each other because of our color of our skin, don't see each other because our religion. We see each other because we're human beings. We see each other because we want to get ahead. We see each other because we see in each other similarities. First to go to the university, uh, son of immigrants, 
you know, first to graduate, you know, from high school, things of that nature. So this is it's with it in this context that we have these two brilliant individuals, and I agree 100 percent that we cannot separate, you know, theory from practice. So for this talk, um, our first speaker will be Dr. Lisa Bates, uh, and our second speaker will be Hector Verdugo. So we'll have one person speak for 20 minutes, and then the next person, and then we'll have a Q&A, and hopefully everybody fills out these little forms, uh, and then, uh, then we can ask uh, questions for about half an hour or whatever time is left. So to begin with, Dr. Lisa Bates is an urban planning professor, an associate professor, at Portland State University. She received her bachelor's in political science from George Washington University. She received her PhD from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And she has focused a lot of her research on housing, on equity issues, and also looking at issues of gentrification, uh, post-Katrina uh, disaster and recovery. So she has a vast uh, knowledge. Uh, she is also you know, one of the few women and African-American women in planning at a faculty level. So these are big, big deals. Uh, and this is part of the reason why she was selected, because she herself rep represents the same people that she studies, but also provides a, a role model for all of you that want to pursue uh, a doctorate and also study uh, these communities uh, that, um, that need our attention. So. Dr. Lisa Bates. Thank you so much. It's really been um, wonderful to be here. I feel like I've been thinking and learning so much in the past day. I just hope I can bring some thinking and learning to all of you. Um, this is meant a lot to me to get this prize and I really appreciate being here. Um, and I think this theme is absolutely so timely and so critical at this moment. And it's so critical that planning has to be at the forefront um, of addressing these challenges of racial justice in our cities. We have a cry from our communities and I do believe that we are um, people who can, through our profession, answer that cry. And I think it requires multiple strategies, strategies for change and it requires persistence. Um, I know that for, for those of you who are young emerging professionals, some of you who will be working in government um, as public sector planners, some of you will be working as community advocates and both of these roles are needed. We have to work together, collaborate and sometimes have conflict. Um, but that's that inside equity planning and then the outside advocacy, both of these are necessary to move things forward. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit tonight about the city of Portland's evolution toward a racial justice model for its planning practice, um, and particularly trying to address gentrification and housing displacement. This is something I've been involved with as a researcher, as a practitioner, and working with community advocacy groups and activism, um, studying sort of the substantive issues and figuring out how can we really have a process to have equitable development instead of devaluing communities of color, instead of allowing communities of color to be disrupted and displaced, but to really place a priority um, in our public resource investment toward um, a truly equitable model to build a just city. Um, so we, we started this work actually now three years ago, four years ago, um, the Portland plan was a general plan, it's a strategic plan for the city of Portland, not a comprehensive land use plan, but it's a plan that guides all of the policy making in the city of Portland. And the really unprecedented thing about this plan is that it put equity at the center. Equity has to be infused into every strategy, every policy making decision and resource allocation across our city. And we defined equity as achieving racial and ethnic justice. This ha was two years in the making. Um, two years, the planning department opened their process to create what they called a technical advisory group on equity, where they shared that space, not just with planners that work for city government, 
but with representatives of the community-based organizations that serve low-income communities, immigrant communities, um, communities of color, who could bring knowledge of structural racism, the institutional inequities that are faced um, by people of color and low-income people, um, to start to rethink how city government works, to rethink how planning uh, makes assumptions or builds upon practices of the past without even really thinking about what those were, practices that continue segregation and exclusion. Um, this was a difficult process. I co-chaired the equity tag and there was a lot of push and pull. There were demands by community, there were demands by government to understand how hard it is to do their jobs. Um, and we developed really a space to learn together, to build a shared analysis and an understanding of what the challenges and opportunities are for changing policies, resource allocations, and programs inside of the city. We were also able to identify key practices and key places in the city, whether at the Bureau of Transportation, um, at the Bureau of Water Services, in the city planning department, where practitioners were enacting equity practices. They were doing the analysis to say, how can we do this work in a way that creates the most benefits and the least burdens for people who are most disadvantaged in our community? And we saw ways to lift those up as best practices. Um, and again, to, to say in, in the city of Portland, which is America's whitest big city, that we're gonna do this about racial equity, that we're gonna place race explicitly into the conversation in the polite Pacific Northwest, um, in a city that had never really addressed its past, its past racism, its past exclusion of um, people of Asian descent, of African Americans, um, of immigrants of all colors, to say that we're going to place that at, at a top priority and we're gonna talk about it explicitly took a tremendous amount of professional courage on the part of planners um, to, to go and, and not just say equity and leave it as a feel good issue, but to say we're really gonna confront these issues and we're gonna confront them not just as a history lesson, but we're gonna talk about how we're perpetuating them today. As we did that learning, one of the things that we sort of resurface that had been forgotten was that Portland actually had equity planning in the 70s. Um, so for students who have been, who have learned about Norm Krumholtz and the Cleveland equity planning model, one of Norm's kind of right-hand men, Ernie Bonner, left Cleveland and became the first chief planner in the city of Portland. And he brought equity planning with him. So we were able to kind of remember that reconstitute that value set, that sense of pride and identity for planners. Like, hey, we've, we've done this before. We know about this. We, we've pioneered this. We invited Norm Krumholtz to come and give a talk and had a packed room with people wanting to talk about how to do this. Um, so those ideals were, were deeply embedded in Portland, the idea that communities should participate in planning and that we should do it in an equitable way. Um, so we needed to resurface that, and that was really important. At the same time, we know that just setting a goal and sharing an analysis isn't the same thing as confronting um, and changing some of our practices, particularly when we go up against really entrenched interests and powerful interests like real estate. So communities of color really demanded that the city take on the issue of gentrification. Um, Portland is a hot city right now. Um, while we are pretty affordable for a West Coast city, it's becoming um, increasingly less so. Um, we're in, you know, we have a homelessness crisis, we have a eviction crisis, rents are going up much, much faster than incomes, um, and it's becoming very, very difficult to buy a home um, in the central part of the city. People are getting pushed out to the outer edges of the city and into far suburbs where they don't have access to as many resources. Um, so the city of Portland, I work with the city of Portland to create this study um, to understand what was happening in neighborhood change in terms of gentrification and displacement. So as a
sure, I came in to um, try to reframe the issue and, and bring some data support. So indeed, GIS can be used for social justice. Um, and you know, the first thing that we tried to do with this study was to say, planners have power here. This isn't just something that's happening where planners can't do anything about it. That planners set the framework for housing development, that we need to rigorously look at things like, in fact, zoning codes and um, building standards and our design codes to ensure that we're not creating barriers to integration and affordable housing. Um, and that we can use tools like community benefits agreements, community impact assessments, um, when we change zoning, when we uh, create urban renewal areas, that we need to do that. And we, I tried to um, create and build this model of neighborhood change that showed that whatever we think about neighborhoods revitalizing, whatever we think about the possible good outcomes um, of doing revitalization planning, our equity lens and our racial justice lens demands that the question that we ask isn't, is it good overall, but what are the benefits and what are the burdens, what are the harms for the group of people who are most vulnerable to this kind of change, who are least able to access the opportunities that are created when we have economic development. We have to put into our data, into our measures, what we say matters. And so we focus down on low-income renters, on communities of color, immigrant communities, and folks who have um, low educational attainment. So, sorry students, but we don't wanna look at student renters who are going to launch into a professional career in two years and no longer will need affordable housing. We're really trying to drill down on the households and families that need to be most connected to workforce development, to stable housing, um, and to access to transit. So we have to put that into our measures when we look at the changes that we see over time. And we work to try to help planners um, recognize their own biases. So in Portland, our planning departments don't look like this audience. Um, and there's a lot of me planning and a lot of confusion and turmoil when a community says, we don't want that bike lane. No, 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 no. Well, how could that possibly be? Bike lanes are great, active transportation is great. But when you're an African-American community who associates bike lanes with the new hipster class that is getting a $4 latte um, and living in a $1,500 apartment, um, the bike lane doesn't seem so great anymore. And when you're a community that has been asking for decades for pedestrian access improvements or better lighting at the bus stop, and then you see funds from the transportation department being used for new residents who are using a mode that you don't use, um, that feels like a slap in the face. It feels like only new people are worthy of investment. Um, and in, in fact, as that happened during the time we were working on the, I was working on the gentrification study, um, I was pleased to see our Bureau of Transportation put a halt and a pause on a major bike lane infrastructure project into the African American communities of Portland to say, wait a second, we've got to understand what's going on here. We need to figure out how to reallocate these resources um, so that we can achieve, yes, we're going to achieve our bicycle plan, but we're also going to achieve some of these pedestrian and bus stop safety improvements that the community has been asking for. But we're going to have to facilitate a different kind of dialogue um, and try to get neighbors and community together um, old residents and new residents to talk about what does it mean to, to sort of work together now that we live together. Um, it's been really challenging um, to move forward on the issue of gentrification and displacement because the housing market is hot, real estate interests are really powerful. Um, as we moved into a new mayoral administration, um, the planning department didn't have the same kind of political support anymore for addressing racial equity. And so that kind of inside equity planning work started to fade a little bit um, in around 2014. The mayor wasn't as concerned about um, gentrification. He was very excited about economic development. Um, and uh, the African-American community you see on the left went uh, into battle basically over economic development dollars being used to subsidize major national chains. And as other communities of color began to see how reprioritization of economic 
development money was happening, they realized that they needed to come together, that they needed to really understand how does urban planning work? We, we know they said they were doing equity planning. They said they were gonna do racial justice, but it turns out that actually we need to pay attention to that. We have to hold them accountable for that. We need to figure out exactly what it is that they're supposed to be doing. And in some cases, we need to create what they're supposed to be doing. If they're not gonna do it inside um, the planning department, then we need to bring it to them and advocate. So um, there was an opportunity to partner, again, with, the, with myself and others in the planning school um, to build that technical capacity, that know-how among um, community groups. They have created several movements. This is also the Renter SOS, State of Emergency Rally by Community Alliance of Tenants. And both of these groups here are now part of a larger coalition, ADPDX, the Anti-Displacement Portland group, um, that is connecting to our comprehensive land use plan process, demanding changes that will require community benefits be connected to zoning changes to make sure that communities, low-income communities and communities of color benefit from the growth, the densification, um, the transit development that's happening in Portland and will be happening. Um, so, you know, as I follow this as a researcher, I see communities learning a whole new language learning to connect their experiences of displacement, of community disruption, to um, specific kinds of policy decisions in the planning regulatory structure. W what went wrong? Why did this happen to us? Um, and therefore, connecting to the possible mechanisms for change and the venues for change. We've had more people of color at planning commission hearings than I could ever imagine being in Portland where the whole audience is no longer the same old people from, you know, who the president of the neighborhood association for the past 20 years, you know, complaining about one tree. Um, to becoming to becoming an entire audience of um, renters, low income families, people of color, immigrant representing groups, refugee representing groups who are getting up and talking about the technical works of planning and holding accountable the city for the promises that they've made to address racial justice issues. Um, we have been able to sort of really connect this advocacy into, you know, what's some pretty technical work, right? But of a comp plan, but what also is the vision for how our city will grow and develop. So we've got to get into the nitty gritty, but with that reminder in mind that what we're talking about is our big vision of how we want our city to look into the future. Um, our planning staff, sometimes is uncomfortable about this um, because they're trying hard and they are working together. They've reformed some of their collaborative committees to work with community to try to step through what some of these policies and processes could look like. Um, but at the same time, they're being pushed from the outside. There have been um, you know, banner drops at their department. So this is at the department the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Um, community came and did a big banner drop in their front windows. Um, community has come to city council and talked to um, our officials about the need to address housing displacement as a critical issue. Um, they are setting new expectations for accountability to the community. At the same time, they are, I believe this work is really compatible with the equity planning that's happening. It's bolstering, actually, the equity planners inside of city government's ability to move their work forward because they can show that they have a constituency on the outside that's demanding that kind of change. So I feel optimistic about um, where we're going in Portland. I think that we're able to um, continue this commitment to doing better. The city made a commitment um, and now the community has joined that commitment very actively um, and persistently. Um, through these kind of learning communities and spaces for shared analysis and shared strategizing through opening up city policy making committees to include um, our typically most underrepresented communities, we're able to really push and pull one another um, to reframe issues and to develop new ways of thinking about them. Um, and as a scholar, I find it possible for me to sort of 
to enter those spaces both as a certified smart person who can help planners to you know, go to their bosses and say, a certified smart person, let us know that this is definitely a thing we can do. Um, but also as a person with a safe job, I don't, my job doesn't rely on city funding to my nonprofit. Um, I'm not typically in any kind of political trouble with our mayor. So I can say things that other advocates in the community can't say. Um, and I try to take that position as much as I can. Um, we have multiple strategies. We have allies on the inside, um, and we have our really now visible activism on the outside that's really critical for moving this forward. So I see planning scholarship. Um, I love what Provost Alva was saying. I mean, we're scholars, but we're practitioners, and we're learning constantly mutually from one another can support the technical analysis, we're supporting the learning process, and also what I'm working on now is really trying to document these mechanism, mechanisms of institutional change to surface ways that other planners and other places can move this work forward. What are the opportunities? What are the windows that we could identify to move forward racial justice work? And I have to say that students are, have been a critical part of this. Um, student projects with community-based organizations, whether it's in a planning methods class, um, looking at a racial analysis of a new transit line and where the bus stop should be, or a uh, studio project to work with a community-based organization to develop its own neighborhood plan that involves anti-displacement, um, to just bringing the, the energetic questioning of planning officials <laughs> um, from the perspective of a student, and you can't say no to a student's question, um, but bringing sort of the energy of the university, the, the questions and the learning through creating real partnerships with communities, um, really genuinely speaking to community needs and putting those first um, in, our, in our partnerships. Um, at PSU, our motto is to let knowledge serve the city. And that's been really important for me, it's supporting the work that I do in the community. I also think that our role in the university planning schools um, in educating our next generation of planners is building a new practice and we're creating a new profession. I mean, to see the students here and think about all of you going into the profession of planning is, um, I mean, it's giving me life. <laughs> Uh, to think about how you're gonna move your experiences, where you came from, the values that you have, your families, your communities, into this profession to totally transform the way that planners and planning departments view us, right? And see our humanity and see our needs and see our priorities um, is really, really essential and powerful. Um, for those of you who are really on the inside nerd track, um, our planning accreditation board, which accredits planning schools, um, has really been trying to roll back the requirements that planning schools have diverse faculty, diverse students, and teach social justice as core to our programs. Um, I recently, I sat down last week and read 65 pages of comments from planning professors, planning departments at universities, from professionals in the field, practitioners, private companies, consultants that told the PAB that if you do this, you're killing our profession. We will be totally unable to address the real changes and the real challenges um, and the wonderful, beautiful opportunities of diversity, of change, of new um, communities and populations living in our country. Um, and it really, it moved me so much to realize that in fact, our universities do want to do this work. We want to move forward racial justice and community self-determination, and we, we, we already see it at the core, so we don't need some external body telling us to do it um, because we already want to do it. Um, I, thinking about the theme of this, of, of this Dale Prize this year, um, I do believe that the past of planning, which has been ugly at times, um, or complacent at a lot of times, um, is still with us, but I think that as a discipline and as a practice, we can hold that past in the present, but we can also give voice to the future and a path for change. Um, I think we can look at how our, how structures of racism are and have been enacted in our practice, 
we can identify the actions of planning institutions that are perpetuating segregation or exclusion. Um, and we have the creativity and forward thinking that together with a truly diverse profession and a truly inclusive practice that we can envision and transform cities that have um, self-determination, that achieve racial justice. And I feel really positive about where we're going. Um, and I'm really happy that you're all here to talk about this with us tonight. Thanks. Okay, I guess we'll just keep that. Or you want to change it? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Bates. That was incredible. Another round of applause, please. I think on her last point regarding the, the issue of um, this movement or trend to try to dilute diversity at, in academia and social justice is something that I must say uh, your department, our department, uh, took a leadership role in advocating you know, for more diversity uh, and more classes of social justice not just at Cal Poly Pomona, but throughout the country. And uh, having this theme today is, symbolizes that, that commitment. Uh, and I think that if our planning departments throughout the country reflected the diversity that we have here as a profession, we would be better off. So you are the leaders of tomorrow, and I think this is going to be uh, a big change in, in making planning uh, reflect the demogra demographic transitions that are taking place in this country and welcome them uh, instead of, of rejecting them like some people in our country are doing. Our next speaker, Mr. Hector Verdugo, is uh, somebody you know, that grew up on, on the mean streets of, of East Los Angeles. Um, I will not say use the label gang member, um, because what happens with labels, once you label somebody or a former gang member, then it, it has different connotations. When you label somebody a gang, a gang member, welfare recipient, undocumented uh, immigrant or anchor baby or whatever pejorative terms, it conjures certain, certain things, certain, certain negative uh, images. And I reject all of these, these notions. We should focus as planners, as leaders, as tomorrow's leaders, what are the conditions that produce people what are the, to act out against each other? What are the conditions that provide hopelessness for people? Where at a certain point they don't really care about their consequences because nobody cares about them. Because it's easy to label somebody something and you, that is their fate, or as if they were born that, as if they were destined to be that. So here, today, Hector Verdugo is somebody who survived the mean streets of East Los Angeles, somebody that participated in it. And he'll tell you with his own admission, but somebody who has been able to escape it, but at the same time go back to that same community and those same communities and reach out to the same individuals that 20, 30 years later, that was him when he was 13 years old. And this is why it's important that we have speakers that come from diverse backgrounds that give us an insight into these things. And I know firsthand myself you know, growing up in this type of environment, where in my neighborhood there was two gangs. There was the local gang, and then there was the LAPD. <laughs> and we weren't afraid of the local gang, because the local gang, we grew up with them. We, we went to school with them. But we were afraid of the LAPD, because they, would, they wouldn't discriminate. I myself didn't join a gang. 
because my application was denied because I was too thin. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that I was any smarter than Mr. Verdugo or any smarter than my younger brother who was involved in these type of activities. So when, we, when, he, when you listen to Mr. Verdugo speak, think about his story and think about how we can learn from him instead of learning the lies that are perpetuated in the media that tend to discard certain individuals and not take responsibility by creating the same conditions that produced them in the first place. So as uh, Associate Executive Director of Homeboy Industries, Mr. Verdugo has spoken nationally and also internationally. Too often when we hear about Homeboy Industries, we, we, we think about Father Gregory Boyle, who's a brilliant man, one of the most eloquent individuals apart from myself, <laughs> that I've heard. But you see, Father Boyle could not survive in this environment without people like Hector. Because he needs them, because the homeboys, the people that come from that same, they, they only listen to people that understand them, that they can empathize, that, that were there themselves. They're not going to listen to me. They're going to listen to those people. And this is why uh, I think we're fortunate to have uh, Mr. Hector Verdugo speak for us. Thank you guys. Thanks. Uh, you know, it's an honor to get this Dell Prize, Cal Poly Pomona. I really appreciate it. This is like a trip for me to be up here, you know? <laughs> In the college and go to college students, you know, you know? <laughs> to professors. <laughs> you know, I think about, um, you know, our communities and, and, and uh, the, how messed up things are. And, and, and so I look at my life and and uh, you know, I was born in Boyle Heights and, uh, and raised in Ramona Gardens Housing Projects. I, um, I came into this world with, uh, with some crazy, just like some crazy cards just been dealt uh, to us and my family. I have a twin brother and uh, you know, some of my earliest uh, memories are, are living in a garage and um, having a sheet going and separating my twin brother and I and my mom and her boyfriend. And on that other side, we could, with the light right there, I could see them you know, wrapping their arms and, and burning the heroin on a, on, a, on a spoon and getting the syringe and putting it in. And, and uh, I knew this, that things were, you know, that was wrong, what they were doing, but I, how am I to question it, being a kid, thinking that his mom in that, in, in that, in doing whatever she's doing, and uh, and then I remember one time my my twin brother said he was asking my mom like mom you know she was he was, he was bugging or whatever, and then my and then my mom said look I'm busy right now, and I remember my twin brother said all right I'll wait for you to do your spoons that was between my my twin my twin and I those mom's doing spoons that's what we called it you know. <laughs> And um, I remember her, her boyfriend said, what do you say? And, and, and I looked at like, like what, oh shit, what do we say? And, and um, he came around and just picked my twin up by his hair and, and bah, smacked him around. And, and I started crying and he smacked me around and I was just like, like shit. This I remember seeing my mom getting her butt kicked over and over again. I remember one time I picked up a shovel and was waiting for this dude to come out of his out of the door and I could hit him on the over the head and kill him like in the like they would do it in in, in cartoons. It just so happened my mom came out and she grabbed it like what are you doing stupid <laughs> you know <laughs> and then I, I remember picking it up and saying mom get out of the way I'm gonna kill him I'm gonna kill one of you and she started she just grabbed me and started crying and uh I remember just being pissed off at her. Like, what are you doing, man? I'm trying to save you. As time went on, uh, I 
just one day my mom got tired of it. And uh, we went to go cash our, our welfare checks, the first and the 15th, baby. Those are the good days, you know? <laughs> those are the days you get Twinkies and candy and stuff, you know? So my mom, she, we went to Ramona Gardens, where, where my mom's family's from. Uh, she, she asked my, my twin brother and I, hey, you guys want to go with me into the store? And we're like, hell yeah. <laughs> so we got off the car, right? And it was right outside the projects, and we had to w w cross the street to go into the project area where the store was at. Remember, she said, she grabbed my hands, and she grabbed my brother's hand. And, my, and I, I remember looking at my mom, like, what are you grabbing my hand for? I'm not a baby, you know? And she grabbed it tight, and I was like, what's going on? And then she, we started walking across the street, and she said, when I say run, run into the projects. And, and I was like, oh, shit, she's going to leave this. I didn't say, oh, shit, because I was a little kid, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I said, she's going to leave this dude, man. And then she said, one, two, three. We started running. And I remember running and laughing, and I was so happy that my mom is finally leaving this dude who, who whips her ass, and he's... He beats us up, and he, he beat up my older brother. And, and as I'm running, I'm laughing, and I, I can't keep up with my mom. And I remember her saying, you know, when, you know when your mom gets mad, hurry up. They don't open their mouth. <laughs> hurry up. <laughs> okay, mom. <laughs> so we're running the projects, and then, she, and then the, 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 the cholos that were there, they got up, and they, they know my family. They're like, what's up, Julie? You know, like, where are you running from? Who are you running from? And she said, get them. And they, boom, they just ran to him. And I said, I remember looking back, like, oh, I want to see this. <laughs> and then my mom, like, made a left turn. And I'm like, boom. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so once we're in the projects, I mean, just like, when I think about that, I think we're running from a, from a beast, running into the projects, cholos getting up, asking my mom, you know, I mean, who are you fearing this much that you're running from them? She points them out. They're, they run to the problem. And then, like, to me, I, I don't know, man. That's, there's something about that. Being in the projects is like a big old park, man. There's no, there's, there's, you know, there's no fences. This is my yard. This is only your yard, and you can't cross, and none of that stuff, you know? It's just our yard. And um, all my cousins, I have a bunch of aunts and uncles, and all the cousins, we all used to just play football and stuff, and, you know, for the most part, we had an awesome time in the projects. I love the projects. I remember looking at the, the men in the projects, though, the, and they were the gang members. And um, I remember looking at Little Man. There's a guy named Little Man. Big old mustache and big old, big old guns, you know? Little dude, though. But he was still big for me, you know? And um, I remember him getting my kite and, and, and or saying, come on, go out there. We're going to fly your kite. And he, he grabbed the kite, and, um, and I used to just, like, just like watch him in awe, you know? He'd get a cigarette, put it on his thing, and then the smoke would come up. He'd burn his eyes a little bit, and, and, and he'd tell me, like, you know, he'd grab the kite, and I would take the string far, and then he would, and, and then he would say, now run, and I'd run, and the kite would go up, and I remember him laughing, and he, look at it's going up, and just like, I love these guys, you know? Picking up a gun, I remember picking up a gun for the first time in one of the bushes in front of my, in front of our yard, and 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 the, and the cholo came up and like, oi, twin, you know, they call me the cuate, I'm one of the twins, and and that's twin for Spanish too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, hey, give me the gun, give me the gun, I'm like, okay. you know, he take the gun away from me and then take out the bullets and here, check it out, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> get it out of your system, you know. I remember just feeling it and feeling how heavy it was and, and you know, fascinated, you know? I'm a little boy, man. I, guns and swords, you know? I like this stuff, but this is a real one. I remember trying to pull the trigger. I couldn't even pull the trigger. It was so heavy, and I, I was just a little weak kid. And uh, I then remember him just taking it back. Now, don't ever touch this again. Don't ever touch the stuff that's in here because there's drugs. There was a lot of... PCP sales during that time. And I was like, I'm not gonna, I won't touch it again. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know? And um, 
you know, these are just early memories of being in the projects. As I got older, I, uh, you know, I remember going to like, we'd get bust into, there would be a big old blue bus that would come through the projects and it was like, we called it the Bible bus because on Sundays it would come and they would take us to Monterey Park and you know, your mom's like, get the fuck out of here, go to church, learn about Jesus. <laughs> All right, whatever. You know, they get free Twinkies on there, I'll take it, you know. But then when we go, when we go to Monterey Park, you, you, I remember like other buses would show up and it would be a Liso Village bus and the a Strata Courts bus, and these are all different housing projects throughout East Al or Boyle Heights area. And, and, and that's when I started to really feel like, you know, getting off the bus and, and then, you know, somebody saying, you know, like, fuck RG, Ramona Gardens. And I'm like, why? Like, you know, I look at the guys like, why are they mad at us? You know, and, and then one of our guys would say, you know, disrespect their neighborhood and stuff like that. And I was just like, oh, it's us against them. So, okay, that's cool. I, can, I, I understand that. Stay close to the crowd, man. Stay close to, to the RG boys, you know? And, um, and then later on, this is a still like little kid stuff. Later on, um, you know, we would hear about somebody getting shot or somebody getting stabbed and, 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 and this barrio did it and this barrio did it and, and you start to like put the pieces together like, okay, you know, um, forget that side, and not in those words, <laughs> and you forget that side, you know. As I got older, I started writing on the walls, RG boys, that's the, the little, the little click before you get into the big, to the, to the big neighborhood, the big gang, and, um, and then you start just prepping yourself mentally. Once we got involved in, once we got into, of age to go into junior high school, I felt like I want to try something different. Like I really want to see, you know, hormones are going on, you know, I mean, I like girls and, and I remember I'm going to go kick it with these other guys, these other people that, that were a little bit different. I don't know if I wanted to be a gang member, you know, I want to, I want to explore the world, you know, and, um. So I went and kicked it with these guys for a couple of days, and then one day they said, hey, man, like, what are you doing with us? You don't belong with us, man. You're going to have to not be right here with us. And, and I remember walking away, and I was hurt. I was embarrassed that somebody would say, you're not worth it. You're not worth kicking it with me, dog. And I remember walking away from, from that crowd, and then my people are down over here from the projects, and... and uh, I remember they had no idea what I had just gone through. And he turns around and is like, what's up, dog? Come here. And I said to myself, don't ever stray away from this. Everyone else is going to reject you. And these are your people right here. Like, what were you thinking? You're right. What was I thinking? That day, I told him, jump me in the barrio on, before we even get into the projects. We used to walk from Al Serino Junior High School back to Ramona Gardens. And, and in between that walk, I got jumped in. And, and, and I lost hope for everything else. So I got involved in, in you know, just directly in, 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 in the gangs and, and then started from there. And then that opened up another, of course, this other crazy world of Get ready, man, because it's on now. Now I'm fighting violence, is, you know, this and that. I'm just, I'm ready to rock and roll. So one thing in the projects is, like, when you see when you're with gang members and, and they come out of, like, juvenile hall and juvenile camps, you know, there's, you know, they, they come out with, after eating good, you know, three meals and, and, and exercising and, you know, you come out, your mom buys you some new Levi's and, and the white shirts are nice and crisp and, and you're buff and, and all the girls like you. And I remember my, one of my homie Rascal, he came out and, and all the girls, you know, I just like, like I, I watched the crowd just go to him and he, and he came out, he was smiling, he looked good, you know, like nice and healthy and stuff. And, and I said like, all right, one of these days that's going to be me. And then I got, pre I got prepped to go into juvenile hall. 
you know, one of my one of my big homies would would fight with me just to make sure that I was down to fight with big people, and and that's what juvenile hall is about. So my day came. I did a horrible crime. I um, I it was horrible, but so I I carjacked some dude in, at USC Medical Center, and I didn't want to hurt him or nothing, but I I put a gun on him, give me a keys, you know. I, no struggle. You know, just take it, man. No, no problem. He, he got his little briefcase, and I looked in it. And it was just papers. He was all happy. He used to walk away with that. Like, cool. So I jump in the car, and it's like, oh, shit. It's stick. I don't know how to drive stick. <laughs> so, you know, I got, I got two streets to figure it out before I hit the big street, you know? <laughs> so here I am, and all that, all that good stuff that happens with it. And then finally, I'm like, okay, all I have to do is cross Soto Street, which is the main street that goes through Boyle Heights, you guys know, and get over that hill. Yeah, once I get over that hill, I put it in neutral. I just cruise down to the projects. I'm good, <laughs> you know? So, come on, heck, you got this. You know, I'm all right, man. Boom, boom, I'm waiting for that red light um, to turn green, right? And then, here it goes, put it in first. Boom, 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 let go of the clutch, and then, er, 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 I'm doing that thing, I'm like, ah! How do you do this? I'm just doing this, you know? And a cop is right there on Soda Street looking at me like, you're an idiot, dog. What are you doing? <laughs> All right, here it comes. Juvenile Hall. They got me, roughed me up. It was, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the culture. You don't get caught. You will get beat up a little bit, just a little bit. And then um, sent me to Juvenile Hall. And in Juvenile Hall, that was it. It was... Exactly what it was, what they told me it was going to be. It's just violence on top of violence on top of violence. And um, one of my first, like, really good fights was I was going to school and getting, um, I'm, uh, so I'm going to school. I'm going to get an assessment to see what grade I'm in and all that other good stuff, but no one really cares. And... Uh, on my way back, there's a, a, an inmate, they call him a messenger, and he's walking me back. And I remember just like looking, you know, I just got me in a juvenile hall, and I'm a little scrawny kid, and, and I'm looking, and, I'm, and these guys are lifting weights, and I'm like, I'm like yeah, that's going to be me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit those weights. I'm going to come out buff. You know, I just can't wait. As I'm walking, I see this dude, he, he racks his weights, bleep, and then he gets, he, he gets up, and I was like, dang, that's a big-ass dude right there, you know? <laughs> Try to look the other way, you know? And then he goes, hey, yes, sir. I'm like, damn. What's up, buddy? <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> No, he says, hey, yes, sir, where you from? And I was just like, oh, man. So I yell out my name, but I'm from this barrio. And he goes, forget your barrio. Not in those words. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit. This dude, you know what I mean? So he starts walking. And, and I'm like, just, I'm right there just kind of like, what am I going to do with it? This is big old dude right here, you know? And he's walking to me, and now he's like, he knows he got me. He's, he, I guess he can see the fear on my face. So he's like putting extra on it, like, bam, you know? <laughs> All right. So he's, he's coming up, and he's talking, he's talking bad words to me and stuff. And, and, then, and then finally he starts, he disrespects me again. And then I'm like, in my head, I'm like, Wake up. Disrespect them back, man. You can't just let everyone's watching and everybody's watching. And I tell them, man, forget your barrio. And then, bink, I get hit from behind. The guy that was taking me to my unit was, they were from, they were just, it was a plan. And then I was like, oh shit. So I ran to this big old buff guy and I just started fighting with them. Just blah, 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 blah. And then the staff, they come, you know, they run to you and you got like, I don't know. 10, 20 seconds to just fight it out as best as you can. And then they, you know, the big old staff, they just throw you all over the place. And then um, and the staff got me. And uh, he's like, you're going to the box, man. And I was thinking, I just got jumped by these guys, and I'm going to the box. And I was just like, shut up, Hector. Go to the box. So then I'm going to the box, and I'm bleeding and everything. And then I remember this, this staff, he looked at me, he goes, he whispers in my ear, you did good. He knows as long as I fight back, you know, and, and, and no matter how big these people are, as long as I fight back, I did good. And I thought to myself, shit, I did do good. I 
did do good, man. And I'm walking to the box for the first time with a bleeding and everything, and I'm proud of myself. That's a trippy, to me, when I look back at that, I'm like, that don't make no sense. But it makes perfect sense in the barrio. From juvenile hall to placements and foster homes and all this stuff, why, while I was in juvenile hall, my twin brother sells PCP to an undercover cop just to come in with me. That's my twin brother. We've been through so much shit together. I think without him, I would not be here today. I would not, I just, I know things would have been totally different. I'll get to that later. So from juvenile hall to finally coming out, I had a you know, kid, my kid at 16, my son, and, um, and then I get a, a deal from the devil. I call it a deal from the devil. It's, you know, just somebody who wanted me a part, of their, a part of their outfit that was about heavy drug dealing. And, you know, of course, right? I'm not going to go to college. I'm not going to school, you know? I need to create a job. I need to create some money. And, and then I got into that. That eventually it, it, it made a lot of money. And I got to see a lot of things because of it. It's a trip when you look at my life and I, I just, I think about certain things like, first off, like having, having stuff, abundance, money, being able to go to a store and, and, and buy things and, and be able to go to a restaurant. I remember <laughs> I went to Beverly Hills with one of my homeboys, my homeboy Cisco, right? And, and we went to Rodeo Drive and, and, and I said, we went to one of those restaurants and I said, I want one of those plates with all the little foo-foo stuff, like the little strips of things. And the guy looked at me like, are you crazy? And I go, no, dog, I'm not crazy. I got money. And he was just like, I get it for you. So we were right there acting like we're fancy. And, you know, it was a trip. We, walking down the, we were walking down, and I kept on hearing this click, click, click. I'm like, what, what is that? And then when I see this watch that I like, and I'm like, oh, shit, that's nice. I wonder how much it cost. Maybe I might grab it. So I try to open the door, and, and then the lady goes, click. And then I, like, hey, you know what I mean? Like, what's, is this lunchtime, or what's going on? This is the way they do it over here? And she was like, you ain't coming in this. And I, then I thought about it, and I said, oh, shit. While I'm walking down the street, everybody was locking their doors. <laughs> I'm like, that's crazy, man. <laughs> OK, it's OK. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it happens. What are you going to do? So. Drug dealing, abundance, it, it, it kind of showed me a little something like, it showed me a, a glimpse of real, real life. I know that sounds weird, you guys, but it, it, this is how real people are. They get to just buy things and, 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 and not trip on it and go places and, and you know, I want to be like a regular person. I don't have it like the way most people do. So this is the way I do it. It's wrong. Boom, eventually I ended up in prison. I have one of my friends was telling me, um, before I went to prison, he says, you know you're gonna go to prison, right? And, and, and I'm like, probably not, I don't know, I'm a little smart. And he goes, you're going to prison, dog, don't trip. <laughs> you know? He goes, but when you do go, this is what you need to know. And he starts giving me the, the rules of the prison and, and, and I remember him saying, you know that we have a homeboy in every prison yard in California and, and he looked, you know, he looked through like, like every prison yard in California, one of our homers will be on there, dog. And like there was some pride behind that. And I, I felt that pride, like, that's right. And I thought, I mean, I think now, that's silly. That's crazy. Every prison in California, every yard in, in, in that prison, one of my friends, one of the somebody from Ramona Gardens is in that, in that yard. And soon enough, I, I, I catch a couple years for uh, drugs, transportation and stuff, and, and I, meet, I meet this guy in there. He says, he, he, found, he knows that I'm coming, he comes and gets me, and I've never seen this dude before, and he's like, like hey, what's up, you're, you're Hector Verdugo. And I said, yeah. And he goes, I'm Paul Hogan. And at Paul Hogan, that's my older brother's name. I never, I never knew his father. And, and I was just like, oh. And then I remember he had tears in his eyes. He says, I, 
I can't, it breaks my heart to see you in here. And, and I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. And, but he's a man, you know, looking at this kid that, and here I am in prison and I'm following the same steps as everybody else. And, and uh, he gave me my care package and everything and ended up, you know, doing my time or whatever. When I got out of prison, I continued a drug deal and stuff, and, and I said, I, got, I, I found myself just ready to go back to prison on some way more charges that I was gonna, probably never going to get out. And um, like, while I was running from these charges, I was tired. I was like, what, what is my life? What is this? Is it about just all the violence that I'm involved in and, and drug dealing and... I remember when I was in prison, I had read this magazine. It was a Time magazine, and it talked about um, methamphetamine and how it's affecting our country. And, and, and I read it out of, like, cockiness, like, ah, let me see what this is about. And, and I remember this story of a lady putting her, her, her baby in a microwave oven because it was crying too much. And I felt like I'm a part of that. And, and, it, and it did something to me. I still came out, and I still doubt drugs, and, but it did something to me. And I was like, how do I get out of this crazy mess that, that I'm in? So eventually when I lost all my money, I, I, I just spent it all. I stopped dealing. I didn't know. I thought I could make it on my own. I had the little restaurant and I had a little um, construction job you know, business thing going that I was going. I call it a construction business, but it was like a dump truck and a skid steer and, and uh you know, I'll clean up all your shit for 50 bucks, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Everything just kind of left me, all the money. And I just had to only myself. And I didn't know myself. I thought I could make it on my own. I thought I was smart enough. But I was a damaged, I'm a damaged individual. And I kept on finding, you know, like solving my problems through violence and and, and trying to get back into drug deals, and then I was saying, stop, stop, you're going the wrong way. And I said, well, how do I do this? How do I change? And then a friend of mine said, why don't you go to Homeboy Industries? And so I made it to Homeboy Industries. And Father Greg is right there, and I had met Father Greg when I was a kid in Juvenile Hall. And, and he says, my son, where have you been? Come here, and he embraces me. And I'm like, man. This feels good, man. And he's like, what's going on with you? And I, I talked to him, and I'm like, you remember me? He's like, of course I remember you. Now that I work for Homeboy Industries, I know that Father Greg don't remember everybody because he says, <laughs> who is this dude? <laughs> he had me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> so Homeboy Industries is like a place where how do I change my life? How do I get out of this, this, it's not just a gang lifestyle. It's not, that's all drugs and, and, and survival mentality and violence. It's, it's all my pain and that, it, that I, had, I had to like be told like, dude, you, you got a lot of pain inside of you. You need to get in there and, 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 and touch it. And it's scary. And, 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 and like, I pushed it away a lot, but finally I just started to go in and started to touch this pain, the pain of my mom didn't love me. She loved drugs more. My father wasn't there. He loved drugs more. He died before we were born. Like, that's messed up. You know what I mean? People should have protected me. People should have nourished me the right, in the right way. Like, that's messed up, man. And then I get to touch that and, and, and so, and, and, and forgive myself, forgive my mom, forgive people, cry. That's everything that a gang member is, is to, pull, to push that pain down. We put ourselves with tattoos and, and, and we act tough, like, what's up, SL? I'll beat your ass. You know what I mean? This is all to protect the pain that we're holding on to and pushing it down. Father Greg says, if you don't transmit if you don't transform your pain, you're going to transmit your pain. That makes perfect sense. So we learn to transform our pain. 
I remember starting with just creative writing and just doing this poetry and then just thinking about my life and it, I didn't realize that just writing was such a therapeutic thing. And then at Homeboy Industries, you got therapists that are that you like literally like like rich people. You gotta lay down on a couch and <laughs> talk about your life. And how did that make you feel, Hector? <laughs> Holy shit, this is cool. <laughs> You know, we have lawyers that are going to help you with all the tickets that you accumulated that you don't give a shit about or didn't. Now you do. And like just all these different things. But the, the most important thing that we do at Homeboys is we're a, a, a loving community, a loving environment that helps people heal from their traumas. Like that is huge. That is so huge in our lives. We serve 12,000 people a year that come to homeboys for, for free tattoo removal and, and NA to stay sober, or Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, Criminal and Gangs Anonymous, and all this anonymous stuff, you know? And people love, they love it. They come, they fill our classes and everything. We even have like this class that it's called Al-Anon, I think it is. And it's like for people that are, my, my cousin's a, or my brother's an addict and, and why do they act this way? Come on, we'll help you. We'll talk to you about it. <clears throat> we have people from all over the city and all over the county that come over to Homeboy Industries. And, you know, when I'm thinking about, like, urban planning and, and, and what, like, you guys are doing, you know, I think of, like, I, and I appreciate you, Dr. Bates, by, by, by being in that, in, in, being in that arena and fighting for our communities, man. And I appreciate you guys what you, you know, like for listening and, and considering these things. Look, I know things need to change. You know, listening to Rick um, talk about like gentrification is the value is going down. We have to do something. Great, let's do something. But let's consider the people that we're serving. Or let's consider not just think about the dollar bills that are going to come out of this. Let's think about the communities that are there that are so damaged and let's think about how can we implement certain healing in that community. Like, let's not forget about that. I'm sure there's millions and millions of dollars that are going to go and, 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 and change, uh, you know, I use, the, I use the Starbucks and the Starbucks is going to go up and this and that and all this other good stuff. But let's put it in our plan. To, to either connect with the community uh, leaders there and, or, or the community organizations and create, if they don't, like I was, I was talking to Legacy LA, which serves Ramona Gardens, and, and I'm why don't we have therapists in this, in our organization? Because of our budget. Our budget is less than a half a million dollars, and it's like, why are we going through this? You know? Like, we have USC right there, medical center. And um, anyways, I just feel like we all have the answer. And, and, and as we talk about this and as we go forward, that we start implementing this in our, in our push forward with urban planning. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we have a, a program to 8 o'clock, so uh, do we have the questions? Well, as somebody that uh, does improv, uh, any questions from the audience? <laughs> right here. Let's have a question before the, the, the other questions. No, go, go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead. You mentioned that your twin saved your life yeah. and that you were going to talk about it later, but we never got to hear that story. Can you share a little bit? Sure. So there was a time when, when, when there was a time when the social worker took us out of juvenile hall and took us
is to like a foster home, right? We walked inside the foster home and, and, and there was, a, you know, I don't know, they, I guess they call it foster moms or whatever that they're <laughs> right there. And uh, she was sweet and, and everything was like really nice. And we came out of one bad situation thinking we're going into a better situation. And you got to think these kids, why are they in this situation? It's because nobody wants them. So a smiling face and a, and a, and a nice greed goes a long way. So we settled. The, the social worker says, all right, I'm leaving you guys. You guys take care. Boom. She walks outside, and we're like, wow, you know, like, this is a house. Like, that's pretty cool, you know? And, and then we watched her leave. And then the lady just went from to, now look at here. If your ass is going to stay in that freaking room, you don't come out, you don't. And I was like, oh, shit, like, the lady left. We've been trapped. We've been duped. And, and I remember just being so pissed off. Like, why? Why are you guys doing? What did we do to you? I remember she threw us in the room, locked the door. And, uh, you know, my, I'm, the more, I'm more vocal than my brother. My brother just takes, he just takes it. I remember him, like, grabbing something and just, like, carving on the walls and just rebelling. That night, we got there were the twin beds, and we put them together. And um, you know, we, we talked to each other, we slept near each other, or we laid down, and we talked to each other, and we said, if this would have been anybody else, they would have, they would have cracked. I know, huh? Nobody's as tough as us, dog. Yeah, nobody's as tough as us. And I remember going my way and him leaning the other way. And I knew that we both were crying. And we were crying, and I knew that while I'm sleeping on this, well, laying on this side, he was laying on the opposite, and we moved our fingers just to touch as much as we didn't want to hold hands <laughs> because we're tough. But at least just to touch, just to, just to you're there, man, and I'm here. And, and I think, I think, that the, because I had my brother and because my brother had me, that there was a genuine love that as much as I wanted to die, I couldn't because I couldn't leave my brother. And, and, and I know he thought the same. And I think that that saved me. And I think that when I see when I, th that power of love, simple, in, in my story, my story is my story. My story. My mom, she was not sober. My father was gone. You know, and and, and you know, you, you heard it. I went through all this stuff and everything. And I look at at Homeboy Industries and, and stories every day, all day. Listen to people and what they go through. And I think the bottom line is, where's love? Where's love? And I think that that's what feeds us. This I'm not no. I'm a scholar, you know what I mean? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I'm figuring, I'm, I got to figure this out, man. I'm in this position. I need to, I need to, I ask God, give me understanding. And that love is so powerful that we both didn't give up and that we're, we're here today. Does that make sense? So that was the story. Uh, thank you for the question and the answer. Uh, so this is for Dr. Bates. Uh, what can planners do uh, concretely to help eliminate uh, institutionalized racism? That's a big question. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I think the first thing is to recognize that it exists and to understand some of its specific mechanisms. Um, and I think that, I mean, that's kind of one of the things we should be doing in planning school, learning about what that means. Um, there, and then to do the analysis, right? So a lot of um, planning departments and transit departments, they don't actually do the analysis around race. They don't look at racial inequalities. They don't have a baseline or a, a change variable. They don't know how the things that they're doing affect race. And I think 
part of what is difficult about concretely addressing institutionalized racism is that a lot of times we think we're doing something that's race neutral. We think we're just having a practice, and then it turns out we're having a practice that has really big racial disparities. So just like a very um, basic example in our current planning, you know, the like the desk planner, they have a time limit they're supposed to spend on appointments. Like a, like a target cashier, you know, you have like the green light and the red light that says you're taking too long to do your transaction. So if you imagine who can get their transaction done, who can address the problem they're having with this code violation they just got on their small business or this complaint that just came in, you know, I live in a gentrifying neighborhood and I'm the only black homeowner and someone just put in a complaint about something in my house and now I'm trying to find out what the heck this thing means. Who can get that kind of thing done in 15 minutes and who has no idea what's going on or who doesn't speak English very well, or you know has never uh, engaged with that system. Obviously, it's people of color, it's low-income people. So having this little rule that says we want to have fast customer service ends up having huge impacts for the communities that are most disadvantaged um, and that are most likely to be harmed by the sort of neutral, um, rigid application of those rules. So that's just like a tiny example of the kind of thing, but it, it takes looking at all of those practices up to asking the questions about what are the racial distributions of the resources that we're allocating or the impacts of the policies that we have um, to start to undo this, what's really been baked in for a long time. Well, thank you for the um, question and the answer. Uh, this is for um, Mr. Verdugo. Recently, in recent years, there's been a, a lot of changes in housing projects in East Los Angeles and redevelopment and, and improvements, um, particularly in Eliso Pico. Uh, what have you seen in terms of some of the positive and negative consequences? Well, um, just from my, from my point of view, when I look at Aliso Village and, and I remember the way it was before, you know, let's just say I grew up in Aliso Village and, and I remember all these, 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 like, during that time, it was the biggest housing projects west of the Mississippi. This is a huge um, area of poverty. And, and in my time, there was the crack epidemic, so everybody was selling crack, and everybody had guns, and it was like, I think, eight barrios in there that were warring against each other, and it was pretty crazy. I, you know, I was like, I'm from my neighborhood, and when I would go over there, I'd be like, get me out of here, man. This is just, this is too crazy, man. Um, so then they tear these projects down, and, uh, and then they put these, like, townhomes up, and they kept, like, I think maybe, like, 10% or 12% of the people that lived in the projects could, could they gave them the opportunity to stay in there. Now, what do I think about that? I think... If they could have allowed more people to, to, to have an opportunity to, to become homeowners, but, uh, but honestly, I don't like it. The projects was, there was a lot of, it outweighed, the, the negative outweighed the, the, the positive in it. And generation after generation, I'm saying this out of experience from my own family. My grandmother came to the projects when she was left by her husband and, and, and she had like 11 kids. And, and my mom went into heroin because she was, felt neglected. There was no love in the house. My grandma worked over, you know, like a couple of jobs just to keep things going and stuff. And, and so the family goes into welfare babies and welfare babies and drugs and alcohol and, and then poof, and then we come and then we become that same thing too. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's got to stop. We got to pull this shit out. It's not working. The deaths and, and anyways, all the craziness that comes with it. What do I feel about it? I'm glad it happened. I'm glad it happened. We have to come up with better plans, though. Too many people were displaced. Um, you know, the people that, are, that need the government housing. People need affordable housing, man. My job is right there cleaning those houses. I'm one of those people. I still gotta live. I still gotta have a place for me to live. So it's 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 really it's a hard question, man. You know, but 
I don't want my family living back in the projects anymore. It's, you know, it, I, I guess its purpose is to help families, you know, in time of need, give them government housing. And then there, had, there, there was a second shift that never showed up was to help people get out of there now. You know, people just, and I say people, I'm saying my family just stood there and never got nowhere, you know? Sorry for that answer, I think you did. Uh, next question is for Dr. Bates. Uh, in your experience as a planner, as an academic and practitioner in committees and in other, in other arenas, how have, have you witnessed uh, different communities, uh, tension among different communities, let's say African American and Latinos, and what have been some of the solutions to resolve some of these inner ethnic uh, conflicts? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so I'll just talk about Portland um, because that's live and has been a huge issue in the conversation about gentrification and displacement. So, um, you know, Portland's a pretty white city historically. There's been African American community since World War II, and the other and there's been, there was a Chinatown that was, has been relocated, displaced a couple of times, um, and then somewhat more recently, Latino community um, coming to Portland. There's also a large urban native population that doesn't have a specific neighborhood home, but um, is a significant number of people. So as the issue of gentrification came to the fore, it was really the African-American community that has experienced in this time period since 2000, this hot market getting pushed out, everything's turning into a condo, everything's turning into a you know cool hip place to be and has seen a huge proportion of the population get pushed out. Um, but as the city went to start to address gentrification, that's not the community that they started with. They really started to address gentrification in some other neighborhoods where there aren't a lot of black folks living. Um, and that created a tremendous amount of tension. Um, what, and, and part of that fight in a rational planning model has been, is it worthwhile to try to turn gentrification backwards where it's very expensive to do it and people have already left? Or do you try to prevent displacement from happening, which tends to be not non-black communities of color? Um, and, and sort of everyone said, well, it's more efficient to prevent it from happening, but that left African Americans out. So a tremendous amount of tension and fighting. There's also been another layer of, um, of anger from communities who live in, who just live in poor neighborhoods. There's no gentrification, no one's trying to move there. Um, but there's lots of people of color, lots of low income people, and they feel like they're left out of the conversation about gentrification. So actually ADPDX, the Anti-Displacement Coalition, that's been, I think, one of the really important things for the movement is that they've turned that conversation. It's not just about <coughs> gentrification as a specific thing, it's about displacement from housing. So whether that's happening to you because you're poor and you live in cruddy rental housing in a poor neighborhood where landlords take advantage of you and they really don't care about your stability because there's 10 more people waiting in line to get in your house. Or if you live in a place where it's you know wealthy people coming in and buying the place that you've been renting for a long time, whatever is the issue, we're gonna come back to that, that impact, which is housing displacement. Um, to try to say we need to address it all across the board. We need to focus on the people who are the most precarious, the most vulnerable in their housing situation. Um, but it's still it's still very tense. Um, I know, of course, you know here there's there's all kinds of tensions. Um, you know, when I worked in did work in Chicago, huge tensions, black brown tensions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that. We've got to have those open conversations to say, hey, wait a second, are we being, are we being wedged here? Is there another interest out there that would let, rather us to be fighting each other? Um, let's identify that and then let's figure out actually what we have in common because if we don't come together um, across those, those borders, we're gonna be fighting over the tiniest slice of pie forever instead of like grabbing the whole thing out of the oven. Mm -hmm. Okay, this will be the last question for both of them. Um, and then I'll, when we conclude, I'll, I'll give people some, some opportunities to, um, to 
to be asked questions directly tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to give them that information. Uh, you know, given the time, they're, they're a little bit tired and, and they still have a schedule tomorrow. So one of the questions, and all of them, all of the questions are brilliant, I must say, and the responses are equally brilliant. Uh, but one of the questions is, as urban planning students, people that want to do good, uh, people that want to make a difference, especially in disenfranchised communities, you know, wh what's some advice that you would give us to help us uh, address a lot of these issues that both of you are talking about, or one issue, let's say, in, in the future, like wh wh what would you say now for us so in, as we prepare in the future, you know, once we graduate and, and enter the real world? I guess, um, you know, just, just what, I, what I was talking about is to consider, you know, a community that, however, however that we can make it happen, you know, like Homeboy Industries is just one spot that people from different communities, they, they get to come over and, 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 and um, have the opportunity and create, get the tools for healing. How can we make that accessible to the communities that, were, that, that are targeted? I, I mean, you know, like, like Highland Park and Glassell Park and specifically and, and getting, getting more therapists, getting more, more community workers to, to um, open the doors and creating more like second chance education, second chance from helping the community like accept the brothers and sisters that are coming out of, out of prison and um, saying like, okay, let, now let's help you get, get, get back in order, you know? Rehabs that are accessible not in a month or not in three weeks, but like today, we, you know, we need to move now. Uh, you look at the cost and, and, and it's a fraction of the cost and of incarcerating um, people. And uh, I think education, you know, with, there's certain laws that, you know, go against people that sold drugs and stuff. And we got there's a lot of things that we need to change around. But, um, but for me, yeah, I would, it, would always, it would be to implement some kind of a, a plan for, for healing a community to uh, get it before we, we, we revive it, if that makes sense. So I would say, um, for those of you, I mean, we all, we're all coming from somewhere, right? We all have our experiences, our knowledge, our families, our communities. And if you are a first in your family, go to college, you are, you know, from, you're an immigrant, you are a person of color, you come from a community of working people, that you, you know in your heart that the people that you come from have real knowledge that has value. They really know stuff about what's going on. They know, they, they know the mechanisms, the places where things are going wrong, things are falling apart, things are disconnecting. And keeping that knowledge with you and, and going to that knowledge and recognizing that as just as valuable as the kind of professional and technical knowledge that you're gaining in school, the ability to merge that together, um, I think is gonna, is gonna make it possible to make real change. And it's hard, we were talking about it today. Man, I get called out like on a weekly basis. Someone calls me bougie, someone starts us and she thinks she cute. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, and it's hard and it hurts, and it hurts to have, have moved into a different sphere where you have privileges and people in the community look at you with a side eye. But you have to keep doing it, you have to stay with it, you have to stick, stick there and, and prove that you, um, that you still care, that you still love, that you still get it. Um, and hold on to that and bring that with you. And I think that's the way that we're gonna transform our profession is to truly merge together the knowledge that people have in the community with the knowledge, the tools, and the skills that we learn in our profession. Thank you for both of those uh, very profound uh, answers or responses to, to an equally profound question that um, actually I just made up. Uh, <laughs> so tomorrow they're gonna be where? At noon?
So there's a free lunch tomorrow, uh, noon, uh, Building 7, ENB, everybody uh, show up. Uh, let me just say something about uh, the Dell Prize and, and our colleagues here, or my colleagues at, at Urban Planning. I was actually, I mean, this is probably the best conference I, I've ever participated in and, and attended and, and helped organize. And, and I, I, I want to applaud um, not just uh, the awardees who've actually been applauded too much, if you ask me. Um, <laughs> all right, <laughs> just once. But um, the, our faculty, all of the students here are gifted. All of you are brilliant. But the faculty to take on this matter, to take on this, this type of subject, uh, if you look at the recent hires, um, is it just moving in a, in a direction that reflect the United States and the changes that are taking place in the United States and, and ha taking it head on. Right. So I think without that, we wouldn't be here today. I mean, we, you know, you have the, the Dale Prize, the money, and the everything, everything come together, but people have to come together, they have to agree on a theme, and they have to decide. All of the themes prior to this have been great themes. I think what makes this one a little bit different is it, it's, it's, it's in a time where there's a lot of volatility in our country, a lot of division, and this type of discussion, this type of insights that, and just listening, I mean, I didn't know half of the stuff that they, that they were talking about until they, until they spoke so eloquently, are moving us in a positive direction, are, are moving our department, so I, I wanna thank you know, the, all the faculty that, that voted on this, that decided on this, and embraced it, and, and just went, uh, head on and, and everybody behind it. And, uh, so with that, a uh, round of applause for everybody and the ladies. <laughs> okay, so see you all tomorrow.